Settle down. Thank you all for coming out this morning. Really, really appreciate it on such a wet morning. Some of you even biked and walked. I see Mayor Steve Adler here, who I hear walked all the way from his home across the street. Whoa! Thank you for coming out. Greg Guernsey, Director of uh, the Planning Department. Wonderful to see you here and our other distinguished guests. I'm Katherine Greger, the Complete Streets Program Manager for the City of Austin at the Transportation Department. And I'm the one who twisted Victor's arm to come here. He's the closing plenary speaker at 515, is that right, of the NACTO conference. Uh, NACTO has just graciously agreed to open that up to the whole community. So if you hear Victor here today and you think, oh my gosh, I want some other people to hear him, um, send him over to the JW at 515. Victor's big on Twitter. What's your handle, Victor? Oh, there you go. Well, if you tweet and all of that, there we go. Um, great way to get the word out, and we will work on that as well. Uh, this is also an Imagine Austin Speaker Series event, um, a wonderful ongoing education that supports the implementation of our Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. Uh, they continually bring in nationally known experts in not only land use and transportation, development, the economy, but also topics like the built and natural environment, how they interrelate, social equity, sustainability. Um, so thank you, Imagine Austin Speaker Series staff at the cities for helping us out with this event. Um, thank you to the Congress for the New Urbanism, Central Texas Chapter, for also helping to organize, sponsor, and get the word out about this event. Um, planning and Zoning Department. Um, and this is eligible for AICP continuing education credits as well as your CNUA continuing education credits. So you can sign up on the table up front if you haven't. So Victor's going to give his presentation, and um, hopefully if we have time at the end, we're going to have some Q&A. Uh, Victor is the co-founder of Dover Coral and Partners Town Planning, which is based in Coral Gables, Florida. He's a former national chair of the Congress for the New Urbanism, which is how I got to know Victor, going to Congresses every year. He was last here for the Congress that was in Austin eight and a half years ago, so... Our city's changed a lot, so talk it up to Victor while he's here. Um, he's been the lead designer of more than 150 neighborhoods, urban revitalization programs, and regional plans across the United States and abroad. He's a delightful man and a four-time Ironman triathlete. Woo! Uh, and very active, as I mentioned, on social media. Uh, last but not least, Victor is the co-author with John Massengill of Street Design, The Secret to Great Cities and Towns. It's a wonderful book. Uh, when it first came out, I bought a copy for the Transportation Department, a copy for the Urban Design Department. I think they've both walked off, but that's a good thing. Um, really great book. I know they have it on Amazon. It's, one, it's a wonderful read, and if you read very carefully, you will find some passages in our complete street policy that were lifted lock, stock, and barrel from this book. So uh, without further ado, Victor Dover. Oh, no, after that buildup. Thank you very much. I'm, I uh, am excited to be part of this. When Catherine said, we want you to come a day early so that you can come in the morning and help us uh, with a group and talk about streets. And I said, that sounds pretty fun. She said, it's called Better Streets Week. And I said, I'm there. You can't, uh, wild horses will not keep me away. But what, so it's very flattering to be part of Better Streets Week. What, uh, what better mission could we have? Everybody involved in making cities, especially urban designers and elected officials and city staff, developers, architects, engineers. You are in the before and after business. That's what you do. You, th you have to look at places that exist and imagine how you might change them, how you would inherit a world uh, that was built rather temporarily on a very temporary basis and in a somewhat slipshod way, uh, and modify it, how you might take something coarse-grained uh, and economically brittle uh, and modify it into something that embraces the idea that small is beautiful and rather than a single giant roll of the dice, we might make a lot of smaller ones uh, that add up to something better and more resilient. So before and after, that's what we do. And, and 
I, I feel like a itinerant Methodist minister on horseback traveling around, you know, like um, like uh, Boas in Paradise said, uh, as mid-career professionals, we must panel. <laughs> So hopefully some of what I'm going to show you here is not something that you've heard over and over. Uh, but what I want you to emphasize is this idea of before and after. That you can actually just go out on any street corner in your town uh, and squint and visualize what you would do to it to modify it. The idea that these places that we have built are not uh, handed down to us and uh, sacred and unchangeable, but, but actually ours to inherit and make timely upgrades to uh, now, the, when we talk about streets, a lot of people imme immediately think about what's between the curbs and uh, just about the uh, mobility functions, the conveyance of traffic uh, to and fro. I'm going to make an argument that the streets are a whole lot more than that, although that's an important part of their function. And you have to look at the city through multiple lenses. You have to look at it through this utilitarian lens, which has to do with whether it's well plumbed and so uh, the businesses and houses along the street uh, have toilets that flush when they're supposed to, or the fire hydrants have flow when they're supposed to. And that kind of machine way of thinking about the city, whether the lights turn from red to green when they're supposed to. That's one way, that's one set of lenses, and it's incredibly important. Uh, it's also the one that gets all the attention. But there are at least a couple of other ways you can look at it. The second is that you're, if you look at it much like a habitat, like the way a wildlife biologist would look at your city as a human habitat, and then analyze it from the point of view of whether it's a good place to forage for your sustenance, whether it's a good place to nurture your young, um, if it's a good place to take care of, of your old, you might start seeing it differently through that lens. Uh, the wildlife biologist would probably conclude from the picture on the left here uh, that the species being nurtured is made of fiberglass and chrome and rubber tires and filled with petroleum. You can also look at the city through another third lens. Uh, look at the city like art. If the city is a great collective work of art never finished uh, that each of us are contributing to. And it has this job of fulfilling its utilitarian functions. It has this job as a habitat so we can live our lives. But it also has the job of inspiring us, of sending messages. It's a form of expression. It tells the story of your town, um, of your civilization, like what's important to you. And so when you stop squinting at that street corner from just one set of lenses, is the traffic backed up at the peak hour or uh, that sort of thing, uh, you'll start seeing the city differently. And you'll realize that the design of the street goes beyond what's between the curbs and out to include uh, the landscape beyond, the private properties, perhaps, or the architecture and landscape architecture that frames the street. So um, I hope to inspire you a little bit to start uh, to see it that way. We uh, love to show people pictures for, in comparison. It's kind of a new urbanist tradition to show people the same thing two ways. These places are the same land uses. They show up the same color on a zoning map, and yet they're fundamentally different. This place is the same land use, same density in dwelling units per acre. Uh, and yet they're fundamentally different, and the difference between the left and the right here is design. And isn't just the design of what's between the curbs or within the right-of-way. It's also uh, the whole ensemble of the uh, private uh, buildings on either side. And so the one on the left in this case kind of enshrines on the front of the building um, auto worship. The one on the right side uh, looks more like one of those human habitats I was describing. So we, we love to pass out surveys and use keypad polling devices and things like that um, and ask questions of audiences. When we ask them to describe the town they have, they almost always say something like this. This is a word cloud where the biggest, boldest words are uh, the uh, ones that audience said most often. And then when you ask them to describe the future and what they want, they use words like these. Isn't that interesting? The connections comes to the front. Uh, community comes to the front. There are, um, there are a few things that are repeated. Uh, this, person, uh, this group had um, paradise, for example, in both before and after.
if you think your city is paradise, then you should be working on maintaining and, uh, the things that you consider most important. Now, Catherine was generous in that introduction to, um, to uh, flog my book. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't want you to buy one. I want you to buy 10 <laughs> cases and pass them out to all of your friends and to all the elected officials. Because here's the dirty little secret about it. John Massengale and I went and, and uh, worked on this book uh, basically to create a subversive tool. It's filled with 500 pictures. And what we really hope will happen is that people will go into that meeting with their public works director or their planning director or even their mayor and say and slide with the book across the table pointing to one of those pictures and say, why can't we have a picture of a street like that in our town? And if, you, if just one of you did that, it would be worth all the effort that went into putting the book together. Uh, John and I uh, were provoked into doing this book because we feel like it's one of the things that's still most often gotten wrong. Uh, it's not, street design isn't the only thing that matters. Lots of other things matter. Policy matters. Land use still matters. Location matters. Um, sustainability uh, is, um, if nothing else, a problem only solved for by thinking of multiple variables at once. But street design, I've concluded, is the one that is most often gotten wrong and, in fact, makes the most difference when it's gotten right. And that's why we thought, well, put that tool out there and let's see what people make with it. So we went on a little journey. Uh, John and I said to each other, we've been thinking about street design, talking about it together for 25 years. This will be easy. We'll just knock that right out. We'll have it done by Christmas. And so three and a half Christmases later, uh, <laughs> it took a lot more than we thought. We, we traveled around. We went back to places that we had known before. We visited places that were recommended to us by friends and colleagues. We took a lot of pictures. We made a lot of measurements. We stayed up late at night arguing about why some places seemed successful through those three lenses and others didn't. And along the way, we, we uh, jumped into the uh, important subjects of the day, like public health and sustainability, but also just uh, more recently, the Complete Streets Movement, and tried to uh, produce some assistance for those things in the book. Here's a message for you that came out of all those pictures. 15,000 pictures we sorted and um, a lot of measurements. The conclusion is our species, especially the American edition of our species, was once really, really good at this whole street design as an ensemble idea. We produced street scenes that even in disrepair, you see all the cracks and so forth on the foreground in this picture from New York, sent those powerful messages about um, about our civilization and our, the institutions inside our civic buildings and so on. They sent powerful messages on the, uh, the tranquil residential street also about the social beings that we are. Um, you, see, you can see those messages captured on main streets. A lot of the book is devoted to main streets and goes into this, uh, into the issues of how to reconcile uh, retail design uh, building types and so on. But um, but you also see those messages conveyed on streets that don't have stores on them, uh, like this one where someone just had the wisdom to plant trees in a row. And someone was George Merrick, um, who founded the town where our office is located, Coral Gables, and he planted these phenomenal oaks. And so now every time the everyday commuter just takes that route, they get this experience that you can't get any other way. So at one point, while we were preparing the book, I was, it was in Stockholm, and it was, I'm from Miami, remember, it was five degrees Fahrenheit, and I was, uh, and it was snowing, it started snowing when I went out to take these pictures, and it kept snowing for five days straight. Um, and in the distance, I saw these, these folks coming toward me, and I could see there was a gentleman on his bike, so I took a knee, and I waited for just the right moment as he's approaching me, looking through the lens, shivering, and as he got closer, I realized he was whistling. Now, this guy's dressed for work. He's bundled up, of course. Um, he's on, this is at the end of his work day. He's on his commute home. And he's whistling. And he's having the time of his life. This is the best part of his day, probably, uh, in the public realm. And he's having that experience because someone had the foresight to draw two lines on a map and space out those trees and plant them in a row, nothing complicated or uh, no geometric gymnastics required, just 
trees paired, planted in a row on both sides of his bikeway. And so every day when he goes home from work, this is the experience that he has. Like he's moving through a kind of cathedral of the crowns of, the, of, of those trees. And he's whistling after a hard day at work. And I thought, how many American commuters can claim a similar experience uh, when we have them uh, sitting on the freeways or on the strip shopping centers? Along the way, I stopped on St. Charles Avenue in New Orleans. And most of you probably know this example. Uh, very interesting. The, they were installing transportation infrastructure, the St. The Charles Avenue streetcar. But they didn't just install transportation infrastructure. They built the, this wide median as a kind of linear park that made addresses. So they built addresses for all of the homes and institutions and businesses that are along St. Charles here in the Garden District. Um, and they planted those trees in a row. And so the result is not even something you think of as a transportation infrastructure. You think of it as place. And that's the aspiration we need to nudge all of our transportation uh, officials in the transpocracy, all of our urban designers and city planners uh, into. Now, if you look closely at this picture, you'll see that just between the tracks, uh, there's a kind of worn place. You see that? Worn, the, where the grass is worn out? Anybody know what that is? What? Who, who wore that out? The runners. Yeah, the joggers. And people going for a stroll, and occasionally a fat tire cyclist. Um, yeah, so the, the runners are there, and they, uh, when they hear the little ding-ding of the streetcar, they step out of the way, and seven seconds later, the streetcar has gone by, and they jump back onto their worn place in the median and uh, continue their run. And how different is that from the uh, installations of new light rail systems around the country or new, new uh, streetcars where we're constantly being asked to surround each mode of travel with its own fence and its own, and if not also razor wire at the top of that fence to keep the modes from mixing in a way like that. By the way, this, this idea that you can gather more than one user into the same space is a fundamental idea of complete streets and shared space in particular. Uh, it's exhibited here. And it's, fig it's fitting that in New Orleans they don't call this the median. They call it the neutral ground. Sounds like you should have a duel on the neutral ground, right? I love that. Uh, so, so those are the kinds of things we discovered. We, we looked at John Nolan's plans, uh, like this one from Charlotte, where if you're lucky enough to be sharing that road, you get the experience that comes from the fact that he chose, when it wasn't popular to do so, to plant native species. Um, people weren't talking that way in 1910, 1920. They planted uh, native species from that part of the Piedmont in North Carolina, um, specified a lot of tree planting, even though he knew that his developer clients would um, be long gone and the houses long occupied before those trees grew up into this maturity. But now you have this great experience of passing through a climax forest. Uh, in Myers Park. And so um, these are the kinds of things we kept uh, trying to document and come back. There were, so a few conclusions from that. One, the people who build things, who put one brick on top of another, uh, in particular public works heroes, um, were once beloved by their communities. They, they weren't the bad guys and bad gals who uh, made things worse every time they built something. And so if we think about the tendency of new and expensive public works to generate controversy, it may be partly because we're not building the postcard pictures of the town we, that, that our people will love, that will make them love their country. Um, and some of this comes from just uh, giving up on uh, a couple of things that were common in the old city uh, and uncommon in the sprawl era. We, we had an experiment underway during the 20th century. You remember that millennium? The 20th yes, We're done with that now. Okay. But the, we had an experiment underway with pushing everything farther apart, and, then, and we did that for good reasons, because it wasn't healthy to have all of the uh, toxic industrial uses right where people were trying to live. Uh, and we went on uh, a long 70-year experiment with pushing everything farther apart and assuming everybody would drive everywhere for everything. And if you just go up into a helicopter and you take a look at how that actually consumed land, 
Uh, what you realize is that we were, got really good at building boxes poking out of parking lots and not really good at building the human habitat or, or the city as a place where people want to be. And, of course, the metastasized version of that just gets more and more expensive to support. The ultimate uh, expression of pushing things farther apart um, and designing the city more like a tree and less like a web is that eventually everybody shows up at the same intersection at the same time and you have to do this. Um, and the farther you zoom out, take your helicopter higher, the more of it you see, kind of like a great asphalt coating uh, over all, so much of our continent. So the, the journey to uh, make the book just brought us to this conclusion. The answer is build places where people want to be. If we do that, then we're building the transportation infrastructure uh, the right way. We're also carrying out the missions of economic development, historic preservation, environmental sustainability, real estate uh, uh, placemaking. So I'll give you five things. These are, this is my five, little list of five things I teach citizen planners to go demand of their uh, city staff, of their elected officials, uh, and they're not hard to remember. The streets that are places where people want to be almost always have a few things, uh, the same five things. First, it, they have a shape. Uh, they get their shape from the things that frame it on either side, like a room. You see urban designers make this expression. Yes, I'm a University of Miami fan, but it's not, it's not just this. The public room of the street has walls and the floor, just like a three-dimensional space we're in. And depending on their proportions, building height to street width, you either get a strong sense of place or you don't. And so this, this is in Boulder. What you're going to see is that mainly, despite whatever we might be doing down between the curbs, that shape comes from the positioning of buildings and trees. Uh, and you push them farther for one effect, you bring them closer for another, and that's part of the variety of the city. When it gets too far apart, the sense of place falls apart with it, and so does the value of the land in many, many cases. So I, well, here's one lesson. You can't just do transportation projects or street design projects without simultaneously working on land use, urban design, and transportation because ultimately the regulations that specify where the fronts of those buildings belong or whether they have doors and windows facing the street or blank walls facing the street, whether the parking's in the front or in the side on the back, are going to have to go with your great idea for what to do in the right of way uh, in order to create the effect of any of the kinds of streets that I've shown you. So we look at those proportions, it's actually quite well documented. Um, Every architect that has the AIA graphic standards book has this right there in their, uh, above their desk. Um, so when we hand out those keypad polling devices and we ask people what they respond to, well, they almost always respond very negatively to this and very positively to that. You know what I mean? And it, has a, it, it isn't the land use, by the way. These are both lodging. Uh, it's something else. It's that shape of the public space and the architecture. Second, they have to be adapted to the climate in a place and be comfortable places for those people to be. And the answer there varies with, uh, with context. In a hot and sticky place, uh, we tend to solve for comfort with uh, extensions of the architecture, canopies and galleries and arcades and colonnades, for example. Uh, in a temperate zone, we use street trees uh, wisely so that they let a lot of filtered light down onto the sidewalk in the summertime, that dappled sunshine on the sidewalk. But in the winter, they lose their leaves and they let the sun come in at that lower angle and warm the buildings and the streets. So that's part of how we give comfort to the street. And if we don't make it comfortable for people, don't expect them to walk. So that decision about whether to plant a street tree or whether to have an awning on that building, it actually has regional implications. Because if nobody can walk, they probably won't walk and use transit. If they probably won't bike either. And if they won't walk and bike and use transit, they're going to drive everywhere for everything, and they're going to make your road congestion at the peak hour, at the worst intersections, worse rather than better. So if you're deciding whether to put a storefront or a blank wall facing the street, you're making a regional decision. The ultimate think global, act local. Now, connectedness. The third thing we look for is that the streets where people want to be tend to be connected to their surroundings. Uh, and be on the way to somewhere else so that you can move about your town. 
And when there are very few intersections per square mile, it's very hard to do that. So you end up just going back to your car. So for example, in the, in the classic suburbs here, Texas example, we don't get very many intersections per square mile. This map is at the same scale, so just toggling back. Here's a more recent development, uh, a, a proud early accomplishment of the new urbanists, um, in which there are a lot more little dots there, just basically at the same scale you're seeing. There are more ways to go. The city is less like a tree and more like a web. And when the blocks are smaller, more walking can happen. Uh, but just so we don't get cocky, this is Rome at the same scale. The, basically, the small blocks are a piece of essential equipment. They're part of the apparatus of the walkable city. So when you think about street design, I don't want you to just think about the right-of-way when you think about the adjacent buildings. But I don't want you to stop there. I want you to think about the street pattern, the network of blocks and streets uh, in the neighborhood design. Well, that means that the engineer has to work with the city planner on the form of the city as a whole. And the third, and perhaps most important in a time of confidence crisis about going out into the street uh, is safety. And that comes in several forms, but uh, the first one is just the getting uh, over this fear that we're going to be creamed by a car going at excessive speeds and killed in the mean streets of Florida or Texas or California or Arizona. Uh, NACTO published this beautiful uh, comparison showing how much of the field of vision a driver is actually likely to take in, process, and act upon at various speeds. And what you see is that down at the bottom, at the higher speed, there's very little of the scene that they have time to react to uh, and see. And just a, at 20 miles an hour, they actually see that person that's about to step into their path. Or at 50 miles an hour, they'll notice that there are several of those people. Um, it's, it, to make this point, if you are moving slowly through the space in a motor vehicle, not only do you get to see more of what's going on, by the way, for the economic development-minded folks, that means a much better chance you could sell someone, sell someone something when they're moving slowly. You, have, you can see more, but you also have more time to react because uh, of your moving slowly. And then third, if there is a collision, there will be a lot less mayhem um, as a result. Safety also comes from thinking hard about the many users of the space and where necessary setting aside the space for them. And uh, here's a great example where the city made, this is Paris, they made the decision uh, to get the cars into less of the street and save more of it for walking, biking, transit, taxis, and cycling. Um, and I like this picture because it actually shows our complex species again. Remember, wildlife habitat. Here, the species includes this guy on the left uh, who's, who's clipped in, he's, uh, he's got a helmet, he's in spandex, he's a mammal. Do you know that acronym? Middle-aged man in lycra? That's pretty good. So I relate to this guy. The, um, to his right, the young lady, no helmet, uh, casual clothing, moving slower, sitting upright. And to her right, the a gentleman dressed for work, got a backpack, looks like he's silver hair, a little older, he's taking a break on the curb. You see, the cyclists aren't all the same. And so we can't actually assume that there's a one-size-fits-all habitat for them either, any more than we do for our cars. We take for granted that the cars are different. And if you look beyond uh, him in this frame, you see taxis and buses. So they actually go, they let the... Um, Taxis and buses share the, the space uh, with the cyclists. So very clever design and beautiful. Safety means also just designing the thing so that it doesn't induce bad behavior. I, this intersection in Forest Hills Gardens shows a very tight little turn. See the curb radius at the corner? Uh, just three or four feet of nice granite curb. If you look closely uh, there, you'll find a few little black marks where somebody's tire occasionally grazed up against it, and that means they got a, what Walter Kulash would call a gentle reminder, that this is a place where there are old people crossing the street, and kids are playing, and people live here, and they should slow down, not go terracing around that corner. The, uh, see the street tree planted right at the corner? Of unusual design, very hard to get permission to do that these days. Uh, violates 17 different rules in five different manuals. Uh, and yet, once again, that's controlling our behavior when we come to that intersection as a motorist and we go around that corner. So the old response, the, the mid-20th century response, would have been 
never plant that tree there, or if it's there, cut it down, because there's a chance someone might go fast around this corner and have a collision. Um, the, the right response is, um, if, if you make those changes, almost everybody will go too fast around these corners. Uh, so design the city for the behavior that you want. Now, the last of uh, uh, safety course go, has many other dimensions, like getting over the fear of being mugged by making sure there are what Jane Jacobs called eyes on the street. It means um, making it clear that if you ran into trouble, someone would be able to come help you. Is that a tornado warning? <laughs> um, they may all go off at once if that's what that is. So, um, so there's more dimensions to safety, but I think the first one is just getting over the fear we're going to get killed by a car. The last of the criteria I put out there, memorable, is perhaps the hardest one, the most elusive, the most place-specific to your own town. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a good example of that. This is the Avenue of Diana in Paris with the Arc de Triomphe at the end. A very helpful accessory for making this place memorable, wouldn't you say? Um, so here's the surprise about the Avenue Diana. It's, um, it's the world's most beautiful parking lot. The world's most beautiful parking lot is not a parking lot, it's a street. There are uh, between three and 400 cars parked on street per block on the Avenue Diana. And, and you don't even think about it because uh, they're parked along those tree lines, which are the dominant visual feature. Uh, the street itself has been broken down into a multi-way boulevard cross-section, so there's side access lanes that are slow and center lanes. Uh, it's beautifully paved. And, of course, it has that distracting big stone thing at the end of the vista. So uh, next time someone says, well, we've we, we got to put a big parking lot here, uh, ask them if they can make a great street instead. Uh, just might have as many spaces as they need. Here's the Avenue Diana from up above, so you can get an idea how they cleverly did that. Obviously, a retrofit, not designed around the car, and that's why it works. So the menu is too small in most communities. Uh, they have three standard cross-sections in the public works manual, um, and uh, we think the menu should be bigger, should have, have a much wider range of possibilities, including skinny streets, including streets as good as St. Charles, step streets, including paseos and pedestrian-only spaces. Um, you're not going to get the shape unless you change the land development regulations. So that means working hand-in-hand, hand, department to department. Um, and so as you, you want to just compare this, you can have a build-to line which specifies where the fronts of the buildings go. And the architecture within that can vary wildly, as it does here. Um, or you can have a setback which says, put your building wherever you want as long as it's behind this line. Uh, this one's for the Fayetteville guys. Uh, Arkansas picture. Um, and so the building-to-street relationship is undergoing... Uh, revival. We're kind of com recovering from amnesia about that. In architecture profession, uh, the last 20 years have been about relearning how to do that, how to get those uh, buildings with their uh, doors and windows facing the street. And honestly, to have a good building-to-street relationship in architecture, you need a good street. So I applaud the work, uh, for example, done here by Jeanette Sadek Khan on the right at Madison Square in New York. That's the famous Flatiron Building. <coughs> in the back. And when they came in in the middle of the night and they put the planters and tubs and uh, the stones and so on, the epoxy paint and movable tables and chairs, uh, they did something great for New York um, when they just took back some of the pavement. And what's interesting is the next morning the New Yorkers came streaming out of these buildings and into those movable tables and chairs and they knew exactly what to do with them. You know, so the species doesn't forget too easily. Uh, so the context for this kind of thinking, you, of course, downtown, that's probably where it's most obvious. But it's also important in infill development and the creation of new streets and new neighborhoods on the, uh, the land that is skipped over. Um, this is the skinniest new street in Colorado. Uh, it's a big factor for us in redevelopment as well. Yeah. I'm sorry to Sure. Okay. Classic. <laughs> well, at least it wasn't a bomb scare. <laughs> so we'll just resume and I'll show you my last few slides here. So there are a lot of places where this, uh, this idea of the street as an ensemble plays out. One of them is in downtown. That's probably pretty obvious. It's also true in infill development. This is a 
the skinniest new street in Colorado and a neighborhood that was fitted in among um, uh, in lost space and among existing places. And it's true in redevelopment where we are coming to one of the corridors that was built out uh, for one story buildings poking out of parking lots and gets replaced with mixed use buildings uh, that are more intensive. And so the settings for this thinking are, are a lot. Now, one of the most intriguing ones is retrofitting suburbia. Uh, it's not that no walking happens in suburbia. If you look at the picture on the left here, you see the guy in the median there, uh, or in the, the, the swale, uh, making his way. It's that the walking happens in an unsafe way and, and, and far less frequently than we would want it to. But it is possible to select the locations in suburbia and declare them places you want to make walkable and urban and, um, and begin modifying them so that their, uh, their street network becomes tighter, the streets themselves are redesigned, uh, the building to street relationships are restored. Now, what about complete streets? I think we're in a kind of change of phase, like um, puberty of the complete streets movement. Um, and in the beginning, it was necessary uh, to advance complete streets, um, first to co-opt the, uh, the design vocabulary of highway engineering uh, and to do things that are quick and cheap on a pilot project basis. We'll still need to do a lot of pilot projects. Um, so here, for example, in, this is in Long Beach, California, which is kind of the, the Brooklyn of Los Angeles. It's a real city with a real downtown and a, a creative population. Um, you can see the historic buildings and so on. Uh, but like most places, their streets metastasized to being too big. And they started making changes, uh, welcome changes, to make it a bike-friendly city. And that's all good. But here, the example that you see in this picture, uh, kind of emblematic of a lot of early phase uh, or juvenile phase complete streets projects, is uh, the green paint and then the swerve to accommodate the left turn car. Uh, by the way, chapter and verse right out of the design manual on how you're supposed to do it. Uh, so that ends up becoming what people think we mean when we say complete streets. Add more stripes, add more paint, uh, add more signs, um, sometimes leaning. Uh, and it all looks pretty much like uh, the same toolkit design vocabulary uh, that's used for highway design. Uh, here's another one perfectly butter smooth, newly paved green lanes. Um, uh, say, and this is an improvement over the street that was there before. The street was put on a diet and the amount of pavement devoted to cars reduced, um, believe it or not. And they made room for on-street parking on one side and room for those bike lanes, paint them bright green so people can see it. The exact same color of bright green that is used on the highway exit signs uh, when you're out on the interstate. And this is what I mean by the design vocabulary, bright yellow, bright white, reflective, flashing, um, psychedelic stuff. What does the rest of the world think of when they say, when they hear the phrase complete streets? Here's a complete street from Paris. Um, on the far left, there's walking and shopping and deliveries and driving in the center, bus rapid transit, uh, a cycle track here, that, that uh, bikeway actually uh, comes out uh, beyond the curb here at the intersection, but just a little further back in the picture, it goes along the tree line under the shade. And then in the center, uh, under this boulevard, is the metro. So the subway station entrance is just on the right side of this picture. That's a different kind of attitude toward Complete Street. It says uh, we're going to make a make it naturally occurring in the designed environment for a transit and cycling, for example, to look like they belong there. Part of the Complete Streets movement is about slowing people down uh, when they come to intersections. Good. Um, so to do that, uh, there are a lot of tools, but one of them is to put a thing in the middle of the road. Uh, here's a thing in the middle of the road uh, at an intersection in London. It's a beloved place. People come to Seven Dials and they step out into the street. There, the, the plaza where these uh, six, not seven, uh, roads converge is uh, very welcoming to the lorry driver and the taxi driver and the pedestrians and the cyclists that go by. And people walk out into the middle and they sit on the monument and they watch the parade of life go by. And it's just one of the most intriguing, happy uh, human habitat places in London. 
obviously if you approach that intersection in a vehicle, you behave differently in that shared space uh, than you would uh, if there wasn't a thing in the middle of the road. Now, here's another, here's a modern American version thing of the thing in the middle of the road. This is a modern roundabout, big upgrade, uh, this one in Michigan, over the old T intersection uh, with stop signs that was there before, and safety greatly improved as a result of this, um, this construction. But look at what it is as a place, the, uh, filled, filled with the signs. Uh, it, everything about this, even though it's safer, sends a message to the pedestrian that this is auto space. This whole address is an automotive realm. Um, even though we're moving safer, um, much more safely and slowly through it, uh, we haven't really made place there. When they put a thing in the middle of the road in Savannah, as seen here on the, on the left, uh, it's a square. It's an actual public space you can use. And the cars approach the square, they go around it, uh, and, and uh, make a right, a left, another left, another right, and then continue on their way. A couple of blocks till they hit another square. Uh, the pedestrians, by the way, can go straight through the center of the square. And it actually made civic space out of the thing in the middle of the road. Uh, in the picture on the right, that one's from Ohio, uh, the, the big uh, college building at the end of the vista uh, sends a signal for uh, you know, a thousand feet to the west that uh, this is a place where there's going to be a, a thing in your way and you're going to need to start to slow down uh, and behave in this space. So one myth that needs to be put to rest is the idea that uh, as long as we're doing some kind of perfunctory acknowledgement of, of uh, walking or cycling, uh, that we've, we can make the streets any way we want and we check the box that says they're complete. Uh, this one, for example, has a bike lane. How would you feel about riding your bike there? It has a sidewalk. Any chance, any likelihood that we'll actually see a member of the human species observed in the wild in that location? Not very likely, because everything else about it is screaming, auto space, unsafe, and undesirable. And if there is a pedestrian or a cyclist here, chances are they're bored, they're sunburned, embarrassed, maybe a little bit frightened. Uh, in that situation. You might say, when you look at a picture like that, don't we need wide roads? Uh, don't we have certain road, streets that just have to get big because we have that much traffic to force through them, like the pipe that must be made bigger for a certain amount of fluid to move through it? Um, there, we have the whole globe full of, of uh, examples of wide, busy roads that are still nevertheless crossable and desirable places to be. This is the Avenue de Diagonal in Paris, which has twice the traffic of the previous street. Um, and it has a big, hard-working role to fill in the regional traffic, uh, connects a lot of neighborhoods. And uh, cars have the center lanes. There's a lot of lanes. There's also a lot of trees. There's a big, that proportion of tree and building height to street width is under control. And pedestrians, and you see a bike share customer, um, and uh, cyclists, and uh, the taxi drivers, and the motorists, and there's a tram on the Avenue, um, are all sharing that space. And it's actually the best address in many ways uh, for business. So my friend Ian Lockwood has this little test that he uses to tell whether you should change something. And it doesn't matter what the change is. The change could be um, a, a policy item. It could be a zoning rule. It could be a public works decision about a street standard. It could be a remake of a street. It could be a, a budget priority. Does the change reward short trips, walking, biking, and transit? If it does do that, it's almost always the right thing to do. Uh, it's al almost always better for economic development better for the long-term uh, cost uh, benefit of the, uh, to the city, to the whole of government. It's almost always better for transportation, for traffic congestion, uh, for sustainability. Uh, if the change you're talking about making rewards long and regional car trips, you know, basically says, please come consume more transportation um, and do it in a single occupant motor vehicle, then it's almost always the wrong thing to do. So I've probably done a poor paraphrase of the brilliant Ian Lockwood's test, but I think that's worth looking at. And the reason you want that test in your head 
is because you have, in where you're working will determine uh, the exact design solution. Places vary. They're not all the same. They, um, uh, there's a whole range of the ways you do these things. So what we suggest to people is that they document carefully a place, not just from behind the wheel driving around, but they get out on their on two feet and two wheels and look at it, that they imagine what the town is they want it to be when it grows up, um, if the, and then do the planning, write the rules, uh, like the land development regulations after that. If you start with what the place is and what it wants and what it wants to be, and then you make the rules, you can almost always make changes, even in inexpensive ones, that become powerful. This, this before and exa after example has um, a street that was doing nothing for the economics of the city in the before state, very small amounts of change uh, to the traffic pattern or anything else turned it into the social center of the neighborhood. Um, it's really quite amazing, the before and after. So I think our our job is to take a, an American public that is suspicious of growth and change, almost always convinced by the built evidence that growth and change makes things worse rather than better, and restore their confidence in the idea that we can have growth and change that make things better rather than worse. That you actually start with the place that you know and you could add to it and you could have it become denser and you could accommodate population growth uh, and economic exchanges and social exchanges to expand and yet have it be better and more charming, desirable, more valuable than it was before. Uh, that's our job, uh, thinking before and after. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming back in after the tornado. <laughs> Should we stop here? I'm good. Okay. Then we're going to stop the tape. But if anybody wants to talk more, I know you have to take late because of the hallway. Right. I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes worth of questions. Do you want to stick around for some concerns? Okay, good. I'll do that. Should we record it? Yeah. You want to stay on the tape? Sure. Okay, great. Let's do it. So who has questions? What? Uh, who have I provoked? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> What's your name? Mm -hmm. And um, that time I was like two years in office. Uh, mm. uh, yeah. And so. Uh, Is it not true here? What? Is it not true here? Uh, there are people that I'll repeat the question. So the question was about the building height to street width proportion. And um, Eleanor says that's, that's an idea that's been poo pooed here in Austin. That there are people who say they don't think it matters. Uh, so the. One of the things you probably picked up on through my filibuster here this morning was uh, it's almost always better to use images uh, than it is words or even gestures to describe these things. Um, the uh, It's really hard to photograph a place that does not have some sense of spatial enclosure uh, and use that photograph as evidence that placemaking occurred. Spatial enclosure, the effect that you get from having a certain um, comfortable amount of the sky within your field of vision, um, spatially defined by the buildings on our end or the trees on either side. Um, I bet that human eyes and our, physio our physiognomy are, are c pretty close, pretty similar in Austin to what they are in um, all those other cities and where all those places where the pictures are. But I'm curious, um, wide open spaces, which is one of the things that we love about the, um, the American continent and uh, the American Southwest in particular and Texas more specifically. Um, so the idea of having a building height to street width proportion feel good um, in a, in a certain street doesn't mean you have to do away with wide open spaces in your region as a whole or your or your state as a whole. I'm actually talking about other cities, which, uh, you know, they've lost that concept. That's why the buildings are so tall is the reason mm. because they're just looking at the first story building. Right. So the, okay, so the other extreme isn't somebody who's saying, let me push the building farther away. They're saying, let me make the building as tall as I want. Okay. 
Um, so there are a couple of questions you can ask about high rises. One is, um, is it a tower in the sense of the proud American skyscraper tradition, uh, which almost always resulted in, uh, if you look at the best examples from the 1920s, 30s, for example, um, it almost always resulted in a good building to street relationship down in the bottom 30 feet. Um, or is it a tower that's sitting on top of a parking podium? And the, the bottom of the whole pedestal or base of the building is consumed by the parking storage. It's the first question to ask. And if you, uh, I suspect one of the reasons why people feel the need to go really tall is because they're satisfying a very high minimum parking requirement, either imposed on them by their own bad habits or um, obsolete regulations or the banks and tenants. Um, and high minimum parking requirements, if that's what's causing the towers to grow taller than they otherwise would need to be to satisfy the same amount of social and economic exchange, that is, the same uh, number of square feet or the same number of dwelling units and so on, uh, you should look at that really hard because the um, there are towers and there are towers. And some of the least friendly towers uh, are forced into being taller than they even need to be, and more expensive to construct by far than they would need to be, and therefore less affordable than they would need to be by the excessive parking requirement. So I start with that. And now I say, okay, assuming that we've got that calibrated and we've worked hard to get the parking correct rather than excessive, the next question is, what's meeting the street? Doors and windows, balconies and storefronts, or uh, the sheer walls of a curtain wall, or the blank walls of the parking podium. If you've lined it with habitable space and you've designed that base of that building so that there are those doors and windows facing it, in other words, you're making the building as tall as you can make it before going past a size where you can no longer hide the parking in the middle of the block. Now you might have a tower worth talking about because I think, um, and there is, I say, a pr proud tradition of American skyscrapers because there's, uh, both in, in sets of them as in uh, the center cities uh, and in towers that are that have enough space around them to cast their shadow, as Frank Lloyd Wright said. Uh, we know that Americans can make towers that add to the beauty and, and functionality of the landscape. So I don't reject the tall building, but I do reject the tall building that's only tall because of its parking podium. I reject the tall building that is dead at the base. And, um, and so that's, a, I think, a, a way you can kind of work through it. If people are being forced into expensive type one construction because of a parking requirement, they should look ahead and start fighting the next war rather than the last one. Um, the coming era is going to have a lot less cars to store. Assuming that we, assuming that the predictions turn out to be true about autonomous and connected vehicles, for example, and car share, we're just going to own a lot fewer of them and store a lot fewer of them. Those cars that we use only four percent of the time, and when that happens. We won't need to eat so much of the real estate for the parking. And then we'll have, we'll have friendlier towers when we have them. In the back. You know, the question is, uh, are there metrics and, and ways of documenting for the public uh, the advantages or advantages and disadvantages of all these ways of thinking about streets and city design? And I, I'm, I grinned when you asked that question because 20 years ago, there was almost nothing. We were, we were really struggling. We were literally dusting off 1922 books to try and uh, derive uh, norms for uh, that had that were still being documented back then, but captured this idea of three or 4,000 years of human experience in city building. Uh, and now there's a whole bookshelf of literature about these things. Um, a lot of things, not just my book, but, the, but lots of, uh, there's lots there. And it's, it's, the technical literature has become better and more plentiful. The uh, explanatory literature is there. And of course, the uh, massive amount of stuff on the web. So one of the first things to do is uh, go to, the, to cnu.org, Congress for the New Urbanism's website, 
a ton of resources right there available. The next place I would suggest people look is the Local Government Commission, LGC. Um, in, uh, they're based in California, but they work all over the country. And they're a kind of clearinghouse of information uh, targeted for decision makers like local government officials and elected and appointed. Uh, then, then, okay, one more after this. So then the, um, the, uh, the bookshelf for the technicians has also gotten better. For example, the Institute of Transportation Engineers published uh, a book on uh, walkable streets. It's, we call it the ITEC A New Manual because it was jointly done by the two. And its um, long title is something like Context Sensitive Solutions for Walkable Urban Thoroughfares. But uh, that's an adopted practice by the engineering profession. Uh, Texas, the state of Texas, believe it or not, TxDOT adopted that book uh, from the central office here in Austin and told all the districts throughout the state, use this book. Um, and I've been in the meetings where that book gets pushed across the table and they say, we're going to use the cross-section on page 37 and the, the Bubba from TxDOT who said no to everything in every previous meeting said, oh, okay, well, if it's in the book, we'll do it. So that helps. Um, so um, I would be glad to suggest some more. Uh, I like for folks in the lay audience I, or folks that are from the uh, conservation community, I really like Doug Farr's book, Sustainable Urbanism, because it explains the things we're talking about here through the lens of how you behave on the planet so as, it, as, if you, as if you love it. Yes? You get the last one, I think. Sure. Shared, shared space, um, do shared streets. If, uh, the question was if, if we're in the um, pubescence of complete streets, we may be in the infancy of, uh, of shared streets in America. And who's doing it? Where is it working out well? And does it have a place? Uh, I'll work, answer those in reverse order. First, shared space, like the, the slow speed Vonerf where you can drive, but it's mainly a place where pedestrians dominate and the car is allowed to enter at five miles an hour. There's a place for that on the menu. Um, the, so a few places have experimented in more aggressive shared spaces in busy places in their towns uh, that are worth looking at. And I'll just mention three. Um, starting farther away and coming closer. Uh, Seattle, who, uh, where they have redone streets on the waterfront, has uh, implemented shared spaces, curbless. Uh, they're no longer uh, on these uh, key streets being really emphatic about exactly which bit of the pavement is for the cyclist and which other bit of the pavement is for the motorist and the pedestrian. Uh, as a result, the pedestrians are not kicked off to the side, and it's much more like the photographs we see from 1909 or 1910 um, before organized motordom. Um, and so I, I'm intrigued by their work, and I think that's worth looking at. Uh, if you go to Quebec City, in the historic city, they, you know, where they, which were designed around pedestrians to start with, um, if you look at the Rue Saint-Jean, it's a complete street certain times of day. It's a motoring street uh, through most of the workday. And then uh, as you get, really, you're in the peak hour. It's not as if the traffic in, in uh, leaving Quebec City has all died down. But they uh, begin squeezing the space that's available for motoring. And, and it slows down as a result of more people coming into the fringes of the space and using and adding friction. So the cafes start moving their tables out into the street. Uh, they move planter boxes out. Um, fewer and fewer cars start taking that route because everybody knows this is going to be a slow moving operation, even for just uh, a car or two every few minutes. And then uh, at a certain moment, the last French barricade comes off the, the public works pickup truck into the center of the street and becomes pedestrian only um, in the right at twilight. And at the exact moment when that happens, the musicians move into the street and the pedestrians spill out of the fringes and into the center of the street. And the number of them swells and it becomes uh, a, a pedestrian dominated space. 
So it's shared space, but not all the time, and not in the same way from one day to the next. It's a very interesting way of thinking about it. So I encourage people to look at that one. Last, Montgomery, Alabama, just to prove we can do these things in the South. Um, at the end of Dexter Avenue, which is the street where uh, the Selma to Montgomery marches ended, it's the street where the State House is and where uh, Martin Luther King's church is located um, and where the, the State House step speeches were made during the Civil Rights era. At the exact intersection where Rosa Parks caught the bus uh, for her famous ride, they redid Court Square Plaza. And it had one time been cut off from traffic in a well-meaning, I guess, uh, 1970s streetscape project. They reintroduced traffic to it, but they made the whole thing, like a European plaza, very slow. It's got tumbled pavers, so you have to move slowly uh, in that space. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's astonishing, actually, to see it. You'll stand there and you'll say, wait, what country is this? And, and uh, it's had a very positive economic effect. Tour buses come through there, regular city buses, people making deliveries, of course, the motorists. Uh, but the but the bikes and the cars are just rolling right around it as well. And uh, instead of doing it like the modern roundabout, I criticized with all of the deflector islands and bright paint and so on. Uh, there's a circular thing with a fountain in it, in this historic fountain, beautiful, in the center of it. Um, but uh, it's all one big shared space. And I think it's a breakthrough a breakthrough design that I hope we'll see more places like it. Thank you again for having me. Thank you.